movie audiences first saw Robert Duvall on film 20 years ago in To Kill a Mockingbird as Boo Radley. 30 films later, Vincent Canby wrote in the New York Times, it's about time to recognize Robert Duvall as one of the most resourceful, most technically proficient, most remarkable actors in America today. I think he may well be the best we have, the American Olivier. And we'll be right back with Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall is with us. Welcome. It's Thank a pleasure you. to meet you. Nice to be here. It all happened very quickly from yesterday afternoon until now. <laughs> it certainly did. It's, yeah. it's a test for both of us, Right. <laughs> I think. I offered a quote, and I was just telling you how much I had enjoyed reading that Vincent Canby piece in the New York Times. And right. the premise of it was, Robert Duvall's moment has come. Yeah, and that well, here, do you agree? Well, yeah, but your moment is always evolving, so it's, there's no absolute moment now that you've come. You know, it's, it's, you can think of it that way, but it's always an evolvement, I guess. I offer that back to you because you're, you're a friend of 25 years. Ulu Grossbart yeah. Oh, yeah. has said about you that, first of all, True Confessions came to be because De Niro wanted to work with Robert Duvall and the feeling of the two of you. And I wanted to work with him, surely. Exactly. Yeah. But also it was Ulu Grossbart who said, having known you, Dustin yeah. Hoffman, Gene Hackman, for yeah. all the years he has, that Dustin had always planned that he'd worked out his career, but Bobby, he said, meaning you, went on instinct. <laughs> Well, maybe. The, I guess Ulu, you know, he's one kind of guy. He's very much an intellectual guy, and although I'm, I'm not unheady, I, I guess I'm more an, an instinctive person, and the two of us working together, it's a, it's a nice combination, or it has been, and maybe that's true. Maybe that's true, yeah. Bob, when I, when I offer that quote from Vincent Canby, and Canby says in the New York Times that you may indeed be America's Olivier, and I think of that time in your life when you have said, that there was a period when you looked down on actors. But even during that youthful, yeah. when you, uh, before you really studied, and you said oh, that right. even though you might have looked down on actors, you would still go into your room, comb your hair like Olivier, oh, and right. do soliloquies in front of the mirror. Oh, this was when I was like 17, 18 yeah. years old. Before that, I really wanted to know if I wanted to be an actor. I, I, it, it entered my mind. I was flirting with the idea that I might like it, not flirting with the idea that maybe I would become an actor. Because when I went to college, then the transformation came because actually it was my parents that kind of pushed me into it. My father being a military man, it was an expedient measure because I was flunking everything. It was the end of the Korean War, so it was either pass honorably or flunk out and go to Korea. So they kind of shoved me into acting and I was, very, I was petrified. But I had flirted with the idea of maybe liking it, not necessarily doing it at that time in high school when I did that year. Yeah. When you, when you do that, how yeah, did you comb your hair like Olivia? I, then I had hair. <laughs> now only I got three to do it with. Well, I, I'd seen Hamlet or, you know, and I kind of enjoyed it, but, uh, and, and, and I had friends that were interested in the theater and so forth. My brother, they both are singers. And, and so, you know, I was floundering like I had seen on your tape with Gene Ackman. He was floundering at a, at a similar time in his life, a little earlier even maybe, that he had thought of being an actor. And I, and I, and I was, I guess, kind of looking for things to do or to be or some niche to fill that I could feel worthwhile, that I could feel worthwhile doing. Am I wrong in having the impression, having spent time with your friends Gene Hackman and Dustin Hoffman, that there were periods when one of the three of you might be working, but there were times when Dustin Hoffman would be sleeping on the floor in the kitchen, or you were working at Macy's, or you got fired, yeah. or Dustin Hoffman was ADing somewhere. Yeah. But the well, three of you never seemed to get it going at the same moment. Not so much. Uh, Gene said to me, I knew Gene Hackman first, and he had known Dusty first, I guess. He said, you know, there's this, this kid that's going to be coming to New York with a great big nose and a shock of black hair, and he usually sleeps on my kitchen floor. And his name is Dusty, Dusty Hoffman. So we met and we became friends. And then Gene, uh, uh, I saw Gene periodically, but Dusty, my older brother, me, and two or three other guys, there was a cantor, a singer. Like my, we all had one apartment in the Upper West, at West Side, and we had great parties and times and so forth. So when I got did to John Voigt join this group? Well, I was never really close friends with John, but he joined kind of the group in Ulu and all of us. We'd, he'd, we had a production of A View from the Bridge off-Broadway uh, in which Dusty was the assistant stage manager. 
it was before Dusty had made his mark, really, you know, and so he was always getting the bones, you know. <laughs> I took him along to a, to a Naked City. Uh, I said to Herbert Leonard, the producer, read this kid, he's terrific. So, and then I, somebody else that happened was, so Marion Dougherty said, when you're not acting, I'll, I'll let you be a, a casting agent if you want. But Dusty, then he kind of like catapulted, you know, in some ways, in some obvious ways, more than all of us, you know, his stardom has been, and it was like the old days, really, uh, that it doesn't happen that way anymore, you know. When he did The Graduate, it just went, he took off. But it's funny, you know, when you, when you talk about that, and Jimmy Kahn and I were good friends for a while, but like, I was at Jimmy Kahn's house one time, and there's a nucleus of Mexican gardeners in, in the L.A. district that's kind of, they've kind of taken over the work from the, from the Japanese gardeners. And I said to Jimmy's gardener from Mexico, uh, oh, you work for Gene Hackman, where does he live? So he told me, I went and knocked on the door and hadn't seen him in a couple of years. I said, Jimmy, Jimmy's gardener, who's your gardener, told me where you live. Because the point I'm making is when people begin to make it, it seems you never see each other again. You go this way, you go this way, you go this way. And I don't see those guys much anymore. I don't know why, it's just, one of those things. Yeah, I'd like to see Gene again because he and I had certain things in common. We used to ride horses and he likes to play tennis, I play tennis, you know. But uh, he, he's, maybe of all those guys, he's the one I like his acting the best, maybe. Do you know why? Just, he's touched on something maybe that I feel the others haven't. Some form of, I've seen greatness in some of his work. And although he, lately or has picked things I haven't seen him in three or four or five years and anything at all plus as I understand it nothing of, of note and now he's trying to get back you know did I he know, get in touch Ulu, with the you? book Ulu had uh, contacted him in uh, True Confessions at one time he, he didn't want to do it and when he saw the movie he said I, I wish I had done you know because I think he enjoyed the movie I just wondered if Gene Hackman got in touch with you after seeing Badge 373 no no, no? We, no, it, uh, it wasn't that great of a movie. His, ver his thing was better. It was a whole, ours wasn't, you know, it's one of those things. It's so strange, how, isn't it, how things happen yeah. to actors? Because I think of you doing that very early Horton Foot play. Tomorrow? Tomorrow. No, 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 no. That came later. You oh, were on stage. Midnight Caller? Midnight Caller. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. They say you do that. You did it. <laughs> and Horton Foot was there working yeah. on To Kill a Mockingbird. And the memory hit him. Yeah. And he said, Boo Radley, yeah. Robert Duvall, Midnight Caller. Right. And, and actually, it was his wife who broached it, who said, what about Bobby Duvall? Then I did a TV show that they saw, and then the next day I got a phone call, and that was my first feature film part. Yeah. From Midnight Caller to Tender Mercies with a screenplay by Horton Foote? I've done a trio of Horton Foote's movies now, and I feel that's like my best work. Doing, it's like going home when I do his, his work. He's... I asked Olivier when I worked with him, and I asked Tommy Lee Jones, the Texas, and neither of those guys had ever heard of Horton Foote. He's a Texas playwright and one of the best writers in America, but he's kind of little known among certain circles. He did Tomorrow, another play, we did, and then, and then Tender Mercies, the last film I've done, he wrote an original screenplay. Baby the Rain Must Fall? Yeah. Steve yeah. McQueen? This, this Tender Mercies is a better film than To Kill a Mockingbird. It's better made, it's better acted, and it's better... I go, on, uh, I'll say, I go out on a limb and say that. Bruce Beresford directed it, the fellow did Breaker Morant. And you get Dry to King sing. Morant. Well, yeah. Country and Western Country, singer yeah. who hasn't quite hit the top 40 with a bullet. <laughs> no, who? no, he was like a big uh, guy, and then he was com he's coming up. But, me, yeah, both my brothers growing up, you know, they were opera singers. One of them sings with the Milwaukee Opera. So and they listened to Caruso, Geely, Burling, all those guys, and I would listen to Hank Williams, Lefty Frisell, <laughs> little Jimmy Dickens. Now, yeah. your, your brother Jack is the attorney from yes, Alexandria, Virginia. Right. He's also a singer. Was he? he is well, he? he is. He sings with the, the gridiron every year, the gridiron press for the president. And beautiful tenor voice. I like the fact that when you were explaining why you hired your brother as an agent manager, you said, first of all, you could trust him. Yeah. And secondly, your very first agent was a, was a pal from college. Well, my second, yeah, yeah, he was, yeah. Uh, Merritt Blake uh, I, uh, represented me for a while. Or, yeah, yeah. So keep it in the family. It's okay. All right. On that, we will yeah. take a commercial break. Be right Good. back with Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall is with us. One of the projects and one of the things in 1983 is your performance as Bill Vickers yes. in Terry Fox, The Movie. And when I think of all the men you have created on film, 
Have you ever been in a position before where you have met the person you are portraying? Because you did meet Bill Vickers yes. briefly, didn't you? Right, I did. I may have, but I can't recall. I may have. I, I, I would probably have to say no. But there may have been a time, but it, it, I would say no at, at the moment. Was it, was it an advantage or a disadvantage, Bob, to meet the man you well, were creating for it, you? It was neither, in a way, as maybe a strange answer. I mean, I, I talked with the man for like an hour, and I tried to get certain things, which he was certainly willing to, to give, certain bits of data or information. And uh, then I went away and just did it. I, so I didn't really think like about this guy that much that I was playing, you know. It was just a, another part. Although, you know, it's, it's uh, beneficial. I think it would have been, not to minimize his importance in this overall project, I mean, it would be m much more exciting, say, to meet Jesse James if you were playing Jesse James, you know. Which you I, did. Which I, yeah, or something like that, you know, I think. Because Jesse James, you know, he's like a legend. Many rural people in America, he's almost more popular than George Washington. But it was beneficial to meet Bill Vickers, naturally. But then once I did it, that, then it was in motion, and I didn't think too much about it. I ask you that over Terry Fox, the movie, because you're the actor who is always given the kind of credit you're given because your characters have a past, yeah. because there are nuances, there are subtleties, there are, as critics have pointed out, it goes beyond mannerisms. Robert Duvall gives us a character with a past. And while you can mention Jesse James, or I can talk about your preparation for your terrific performance as Dr. Watson in oh, The 7% yeah. Solution, one of, along with Herbert Ross's Pennies from Heaven, the most underrated movies anybody in America, in my opinion, ever did. Yeah. But your work with Nicole Williamson and what you said about Dr. Watson, I mean, here you were, a ten you are a tennis buff, an athlete, a man with outside interest, and you said, hold it, Dr. Watson was an athlete. He was this oh, and he right. was that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like and that's... An ex, yeah. Uh, an ex-second level, maybe, uh, rugby player, someone that played in the public school. Yes. But with, with Bill Vickers, there you are coming in with your creation of yeah. a man's past. Yeah. And my curiosity was, just a minute, you met the real guy. Yeah. Maybe if I had more time, and maybe if, if the, the character developed more as a character, uh, you know, uh, study, then, then I would have probably uh, and had more time, you know, say the lead in the project where it was, there was more emphasis on that character, then I probably would have tried to spend much more time with someone like Bill Vickers and really doing an in-depth kind of survey or study of him. But it was a kind of thing that, you know, it, it, the part really didn't need as much research as, say, if I do the, the part of the Pope, say, then I really got to do some homework, you know. But uh, it was an enjoyable experience working up here. You know, I enjoyed it very much working in Toronto. Bob, when you work with a young man like Eric Fryer, and you have the reality of his situation, that he does indeed have the disease that brought about the tragic death of the character he is playing, that he is a young man who is not an actor. There was no Sandy Meisner, no neighborhood playhouse. Here he is playing something so close to life which he must have done with a degree of tentativeness that could only come from the reality of it, not the character's past and not the screenplay. Are you leaned upon? Are you working harder with this young man, letting him know that he can do it? And how do you help him in scenes yeah, together? Yeah, you, you work a little harder, but it's, uh, it's not really work. It's, it's more fun in a way. You know, you try, it, the same way when I work with De Niro, he likes, and, and Johnny Voigt, a lot of people, I like it too off camera. You know, you, off camera you change, you're always changing. A lot of actors won't go for that because they want things more set. But like w the way I try to work with Eric, and it, it in turn helped me because it kept, helped keep things fresh. I uh, like work with De Niro and all of them. You know, off camera you change the lines, you change you know, you can do anything off camera because that sound isn't recorded except when the close-up goes on you or the medium shot goes on you. So you can change it. You can call somebody by their real name. You can uh, say your dog died yesterday or what's wrong. You know, you can do anything to, to, to throw in legitimate surprises to keep a pers person legitimately off balance. And, and, and uh, that's nice because I worked that uh, way and uh, it, it helped 
helped him and it certainly helped me too to keep a freshness so it's the first time something's being said or thought and real thoughts happen sometimes when you change change the the text itself off not on camera so uh, it, it was it was interesting working that way and and I like to work that way to keep things fresh so so working with a beginner or 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 uh, an open minded seasoned pro is somewhat similar ultimately were you aware of the phenomenon in the country of Canada over the Terry Fox story before the script arrived well uh I was somewhat ignorant of, of that wonderful story, that tragic story, and uh, of course I was eager to learn once, once I knew that I was going to play the part of before even, and uh, then, I did, uh, then I did learn through the stories and hearsay and the documentary on the real Terry Fox, but uh, I didn't know a lot about it beforehand, no, but beautiful story. When you talk that way about the exchange and the surprises, and I remember having a conversation recently with Jerry Lewis who was talking about I Robert heard, De Niro. I heard about that. He got a little ethnic off camera. A, a little ethnic. A, a little. <laughs> Jerry Lewis said he was standing there in character playing Jerry Langford who was Jerry Lewis in, on one level yeah. while Robert De Niro was hurling anti-Semitic <laughs> remarks at him and Jerry Lewis said the anger was building to such a degree that it frightened him because he was trying to control it yeah. and he said it was Jerry Lewis controlling Jerry Langford wanting to strangle Robert De Niro as Rupert Pupkin. So it's all the same really, it's ultimately it's all the same. Then he said when he saw it on the screen, when he saw the scene, he was twice as frightened watching it as he had been acting it. Yeah, right. Well it made him very loose and you know and very in touch with himself. It's like a, it's like a, a, a lighter version to that when we were doing uh, True Confessions, every time a black girl would walk by dinner, it would be like this. I said, finally, I said to him, I said, what's it like being married to a black woman? I think I'm too prejudiced to be married to a black woman. He laughed. <laughs> Diane Abbott was not there at the dinner. No, 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 you know, with, you know, with my, some of my past, I would, probably something I might not do, you know, although it's funny because he, but we had a laugh over that, yeah. All right, on that, yeah. we'll take another break. Be right back with Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall is with us. We've been talking about specific films, specific performances, and you still talk all this time later about the film version of Faulkner's Tomorrow with Horton Foote's screenplay. You were Fentry. Jackson you were Fentry. a dirt farmer who yeah. took in a pregnant woman, yeah. raised her child, yeah. the town took the child away from you. Right. And he here named, we are. He named the child after the two generals his father fought under the Civil War, Jackson and Longstreet. So he'd say, come here to me, Jackson and Longstreet. <laughs> so what he named his baby. Is it still for you one of, if not the piece of film work you're proudest yeah. of? Yeah, I, I just finished another one, Tender Mercies, where I play like a, a fourth cousin of that guy, but much more educated, more sophisticated. And Horton Foote, once again, who's a wonderful writer. Yeah. How much of that, Bob, had to do with the fact that you got to do it 21 times on stage before you did it on film? I thought it was 25. <laughs> it was 25? Oh, you're, you're, you're including well, the previews. Well, it, it certainly helped. You know, it was like a complete experience, which you usually don't get to do. I always say there's a, a legitimate smugness that a stage actor has over a film actor, and that you can always go do film. Not always successful, but it's the reverse is not always true. So here is, here's, a, here's a project where I, I played a character in a small theater, very small, seated about 85 or 90 at most, uh, 21, 25, whatever the number of performances were. And then about a year later, Olga Bell and the, her husband produced it. And it was like really a complete experience. Like I, I had once heard that that French actor Gerard Philippe would go off his version of off-Broadway, do rehearse and do a play, then film it. So, so this was similar. It was, it was a complete experience. I'm just thinking about the evening you were in that little theater doing the performance of Tomorrow and Dustin Hoffman, John Voigt, John Schlesinger and the entire crew of Midnight Cowboy came in. You walked out on stage, yeah. opened your mouth with your southern dirt farmer accent <laughs> and what happened in the theater? Well, it was like some laughter. It was a wonderful evening because I had to calm down, not from nervousness, but from a certain kind of excitement. And I remember at the end, they, it was one of those nights where everybody was browing and they stamped. It was one of those wonderful evenings in the theater, you know, even though it was a small 
non-commercial theater. And they wanted to make it a commercial run. I said, no, this is enough. This is fine. Didn't you but say it, it was like an athletic event? It, that was American Buffalo. That oh, was, was that like Buffalo? An, yeah, that was like an American, because it was like, it was, the critics, I could feel that uh, somewhat of a negative thing coming from that, that one section of the, of the uh, critics, but we just overrode it. We overrode it, yeah. It was like an athletic event, you know, in, in a way, you know, I mean, like competing, in a way you, without consciously doing it, you're competing like with somebody like the critics or something, who are, will give you credit, but they're also there to knock you possibly, and may look to knock you possibly. Why isn't the performance you gave as Teach in American Buffalo, why hasn't American Buffalo been put on film? Well, I think Al Pacino uh, did it for like a year off Broadway, a few years after we did it, and I think they had talked about taping it or filming it, and, uh, and they, they, they had talked of, of making a film out of it. I, you know, I don't know. They had to open it up and so forth. I think sometimes plays do make better plays than movies, and, and I don't necessarily have any desire to play it in a film. I didn't even have my parents come because the language is so bad, so I don't want it frozen for posterity. <laughs> but I, I love that part very much. I love doing that part. I met my wife, John Savage, who was in it, and his uh, lovely sister, Gail, became my wife five years later. Yeah, we met then. When you talk about directors, certain directors, like Ulu Grosbar, yeah, or Coppola, I mean, why not, working six times with him? Yeah. But everything hasn't been that smooth. I mean, when you were... Not smooth Being right now, I can't get a job. Are you serious? <laughs> I'm serious, the right kind of job. It's slow now, yeah. It's not, it never seems to be easy in a way, so. When you say it never seems to be easy, I'll, I'll interrupt myself and change the subject to Angelo, my love. Because almost five years ago, now, you're walking down a street in New York and you hear a boy right. turn to a woman yes. on a street and say, Patricia, if you don't love me no more, I'm going to move out to, to where? Cincinnati. To Cincinnati. <laughs> and you turn around and you meet this gypsy boy, yeah. Angelo Evans. Right. And all of a sudden, Robert Duvall, who should be reading scripts, whose brother Jack should be making better deals, right. pours his own money yes. into making a dream a reality. Yes. Angelo, my love. Yes. And you say, it's the best thing you've ever done in your life. You directed it. But it was also the toughest thing you've ever yeah. done because you had to fire people. Yeah. You're an easygoing guy. You may be incommunicative sometimes. You're and, right. You hit it all. And That's people true. try to take advantage or take over. Yeah, because I allow, I, I allow that. You know, as an actor, I say, this is it, pals. This is what I want to do. Now, as I get older, you, uh, but, you know, directing, I'm finding my way more. So, therefore, people do. I do tend to be passive and then they want to take over and I, then I, it reaches a point where I have to say, hey, this, this is it. While as maybe as, if I were doing an acting part, I would be, I would form the lines of whatever, you know, boundaries or uh, so forth, you know, earlier in the, relations, in the relationships. But uh, it was something, yeah, that I had to do and uh, it's finished now and I'm proud of it. It's one of the best things I've ever done, certainly one of the most complete things, although I, I, I'm not in it. I feel my contribution as the director of such a project is a continuation, an extension of my acting, the study and the quest for behavior, of knowing behavior. And the gypsies are wonderful. They're wonderful. Andre Konchalowski, the Russian director, called it a masterpiece. I mean, I think he really, really liked it. He wants us to try to get it in the Moscow Film Festival. I'm thinking of you doing that scene with Angelo Evans and your wife, Gail Youngs, who is also an actor, yeah. turning to you and saying, Bobby, He's better than you are, yeah, and you she, said the little she, bastard's terrific. Yeah. Oh, he was wonderful. Yeah, he's excellent in the film. They, they are all, all the gypsies. We have one professional actor who's very talented, and uh, you know they keep up with each other because we had a script. They would say I, I couldn't bring it because they, for the most part, they're an illiterate uh, block of people, a tribe, of pe a race of people, the gypsies. So they would say, hey, "Look, let's don't practice. Just roll the camera." And they come up with wonderful stuff, and they could repeat. Like my wonderful friend Wilfred Brimley, the actor, a great actor, who I'm going to direct in two years in another project, hopefully. He said, these gypsies, he said, they don't, they're not like most actors. They don't stand in line waiting for their turn to talk. He says, they really listen and talk, talk and listen. That's why he was impressed with the acting in it. He does a terrific job, yet again, in High Road to China. I didn't see, he's so talented. He's like these gypsies. He's so pure and wonderful as an actor. I'm telling you, he's... He is something. You know, he used to be a bodyguard for Howard Hughes. 
You, I, I, need, I needn't tell you all this trivia. You know more than anybody no, just about I, anybody. I, I met true. him. I met him. Oh, Bob. you did? Yeah. And I remember Paul Newman saying that he threw, during Absence of Malice, Paul Newman turned around and said, Who is this guy? Where did he, he was so good? I said to the driver, Where'd you get it? Absolutely. And I want to direct a project with him, and I've started to work on it already in Oklahoma. I've started to work on it, you know, because he's, he's wonderful. And, but by the time I get to it, he may be a star in his own right by then, or, or, or not the star, or, you know, a leading actor in films, which he should be, because he, he's terrific. We're, We're talking friends. about directing a lot. You, are you leaning more and more behind the camera, or is it actor director? Well, I'm an actor the rest of my life, you know, but, but as I say, it's an extension of that. I, 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 I think that uh, every few years I will direct. Well, this is my second film, Angelo, My Love. I did a documentary with at the Jet Set. And every few years I'm going to do a film, not so much under establish, establishment auspices or Hollywood auspices. I have to kind of develop it myself because I, it, like uh, Cassavetes, John Cassavetes had seen the documentary I'd done, I guess had liked it, set, had sent a script via a friend of mine to me. And I looked at it and said, I wouldn't know how to direct this. I wouldn't know how to do that. It, it, anything I direct now or in the future has to be something that I kind of develop from me and comes from me that so I understand it from the ground groundwork up I just couldn't take a script that somebody sent me and I don't think I could direct but uh, you know I hope someday you get to see Angelo my love because and we're having a special exhibition showing at the Cannes Film Festival maybe we should all just fly to Cannes and well, see the gala I, I can get this <laughs> it's just it, it, we're very proud of it, you know, and uh, certain people that I respect, like Copel, certain people like that, like it very much, so that means a lot to me, that, that certain people I have, I respect a lot, do like it. Do. When you say that your gypsy boy, Angelo yeah. Evans, the only person he trusts, or trusted, was his mother. That's true. Did his mother trust you? I don't know. In a strange way, maybe. Uh, we were seven-eighths three quarters of the way through filming and we had been working actively on the project for two and a half years and for two and a half it took two and a half years to get her to sign a release or a contract on that boy she put an X and you know she had us but I guess they figured if they pulled any of the shenanigans that might be pulled by gypsies or, or, or we, we think the gypsies might pull and they do at times definitely uh, I guess if they figured if they pulled that the if the film weren't finished, it weren't. Fi if the film wouldn't be finished, it wouldn't be finished. So that's all there was to it. It had to be finished. They weren't dealing with a big company. They were dealing with me. I was paying everybody at the end of the week, and and if they, and she said to me, now if I had have pulled out and asked for more money, this was what was all about. What would have happened? I said, well, I I feared that from the day one. I said probably that's why I met gypsies from all over to insulate myself against that fear or that uh, fear of that thing really happening. And I said I would have had to take a photograph of Angelo or some way killed him off like a soap opera and gone another way in the story. And she said, you wouldn't have. She, she became very superstitious. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I would have. I would have had to. But they didn't, you know. And uh, it took a long time for, for me to get her to sign that release. And so I guess it was two strange cultures meeting. And, and they just, maybe they trusted the fact that I would do this. She, she felt that I would do this for her son who wanted it very much. The fact a well-known actor putting much on the line, five years of a lot of emotional makeup on the line, and, and money, all my money, you know. So they, they probably thought I was nuts, but we did it, and like Ulu Grossbart said, it was a major miracle to finish it, and he says there's not a false moment in it, so I, I somewhat trust him very much, you know, very much so, so maybe it was worthwhile. I look forward to seeing it. Yeah. Very much. Yeah. On that, we will take another break. Be right back with Robert Duvall. Robert Duvall, we've been talking about films and actors, your colleagues. I was just thinking of the acclaim and the kind of pride you had having done Arthur Miller earlier in your career, but then doing A View from the Bridge. Have you dropped in on Tony LeBianco to see the revival of A View from the Bridge? No, I have. Have you? No. No. No, I haven't. I, I heard about it. And Rose Gregorio plays his wife, Ulu's wife in reality, who was in True Confessions. And but but I I've been meaning to go, but and maybe I will, but I, I haven't had a chance to yet. I've been out of New York, and they just opened. 
be interesting to see it, you know, to see a different Certainly cast. Certainly would be for you. Yeah, we had a terrific cast. Who else was in that with you when you did it? Well, Johnny Voigt, Ray Bieri, who's doing well, Richie Castellano, uh, Susan Ansbach, and, and uh, the, the only person that hasn't started to work a lot commercially was the woman that played the wife. Uh, Carmen Caridi was in it, and Dusty was his, Hoffman was assistant stage manager. and would fill in understudy walk-on parts. It was, it was a lot of fun. It's fascinating, you know, preparing to, to meet you, to, to have this conversation. And images flash through the mind, whether I went back and referred to 1963, To Kill a Mockingbird and Boo Radley. And there's so many films. I mean, I can't, there are more than 30 now. But when I think of specific things and how affected I was, along with millions of others, by Bull Meacham in The Great Santini, and what you and Blythe Danner and Michael O'Keefe did together, that interacting between actors, and Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore in Apocalypse Now. And there's always this sense of there's you and there's Robert Mitchum and there was John Wayne and there's always a feeling of if one should say the wrong thing, this heavy hand will come down. And there's a sense of apprehension. Maybe Tom Hagen, maybe even being the consigliere for the family and being so aware of power. There just seems to be a source of power in certain kind of actors, and you seem to have it. I say this to you because you, you show up and you're a man of obvious gentility and sensitivity. And some of those creations, I mean, I don't know if a day with Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore surfing in whatever circumstances would be as pleasant as an afternoon talking to you. <laughs> Is this making any sense that you have created people of such power and passion there's a, an apprehensiveness about the real man. Yeah. Well, Do you get that from people? Danger for somebody who wants to, or, you know, I think certain actors that achieve certain things have certain unpredictability, certain dangers, certain you don't know what's coming next, certain surprises, and uh, I guess that comes within whatever person has within them, either secretly or otherwise. Part of their makeup is another side to them, and uh, it's uh, part of whatever the whatever talent might be sometimes you meet very interesting people actors too that drink and they carry on and you say jeez you know especially when you're young you're insecure about who can do what you know you see a guy like that and he's an interesting fascinating guy you know they drink they carry on or they charismatic personality and then when they try to transfer it they can't then you might see a you know certain people that don't aren't as obviously magnetic in life and so forth and so on. You, they may walk into a room, you may not you know, re even recognize them, and, and they have whatever it takes talent-wise to make that transfer, to be able to utilize what they have or use themselves in an imaginary situation to come alive and create something that's really immediate. When the drama, the legendary drama coach, Sanford Meisner, says there are two actors in America, Marlon Brando and Robert Duvall, and when you say that you are conscious of Brando's power. And I can go back to the chase when you were working with Arthur Penn. And then we go up to Apocalypse Now yeah. and you're working with Brando or you're working on the same film with Brando. Yeah. Was the power based on what you saw on stage or was the, your feeling of his power his <coughs> film presence? I, no, I never saw him work on stage. He, he was working in the theater before I came to New York. And I, I think, you know, like when we did The Godfather, he was like the godfather to actors in a way, in, in reality, and we could relate that way. I just think he was like, uh, not exactly prophetic, but he was kind of a forerunner of, of a certain type of truthfulness in acting, although people have had it through the ages anyway, you know, Spencer Tracy, people like that, Dooza, obviously. And uh, although I don't think there are other wonderful actors in America besides you know, I, I'm sure that was before somebody like De Niro or probably Sandy never really saw Hackman at his best. Or we had once seen George Scott in performance early in his career, and although he, we thought he made a lot of mistakes in the performance, we I said, but he's very talented, and Sandy agreed. You know, different. Uh, uh, there are wonderful actors in America, is is probably as good as are in any country. But. Uh, but I just think Brando probably, you know, I, I don't think that much about him anymore because he reads lines and he's, I don't think he's really 
interested. For 15 lines, for years he's read lines, you know. It's, there's just more of a shell there that maybe what was there or what could have been. Although in this thing where he played Porky Pig with George Scott in the movie. The formula. I thought it was excellent. The formula? I Steve Shagan? Yeah, I thought it was the best performance in the movie by far. Because maybe he knew he had to come up to something. He's in there with Gilgood and Scott, you know, so he had to show off what he could do, you know. Uh, but uh, it's something I guess he had always, you know. I, I understand on stage he, he, he had a wonderful thing. Uh, I think Alec McCowan said when he saw him in uh, Streetcar Named Desire that he blushed, he got embarrassed because when Brando walked on, he thought it was one of the stage hands that walked on by mistake because he was behaving. Like when you see a dog walk across stage, they, they're so pure in behavior that, that it that make the other people look like the actors they are possibly. When your friend Dustin Hoffman picked up his Academy Award and said, Actually, to, to, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, to win a prize for giving the best performance by an actor is not acceptable because actors are not comparable. We're not show dogs. Show dogs are comparable. But actors are not. You're a three-time Academy Award nominee. Do you share Dustin Hoffman's feelings that there really shouldn't be prizes based on the best? I, I, it's, it's hard to answer, I guess, because uh, I, I don't know if I quite agree with him on that, in that, uh, you know, not necessarily pertaining to, to, to Academy Awards, but actors are tremendously competitive people, like other professions, and actors are constantly either comparing, praising, knocking, or looking at other performances. So in that, in that, from that point of view, I wouldn't agree with him, because I think actors are very competitive. whether you know, whether th Oscars or Emmys or whatever should be given, I don't know. I think if, if, if somebody said, well, if you won one, would you take it? And I said, absolutely. In the times that I've been nominated, I was more petrified as, as to what I was going to say when I got up there than, than getting it or not getting it and almost relief when I didn't get it because they say people are always prepared and I, I never have been. And, and, and always the th one of the things I thought I would say is that I really don't know what an Oscar means because We've been educated through the years, this hoopla, 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 fanfare, circus, 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 circus. And you see people, some deserve it, some you say, how in the world did they ever win that? So I don't know what it really means. If it, if it really means that your peers choose you as one of the best on a, on a, on a, for a given year, that's one thing. But I don't know if it really means that. It's become like almost nondescript or, or, or uh, undefinable what that means. But as far as giving awards, people want to do it, so they do it. I don't know. I think you can compare performances. I think you can, in a way. I, I, I don't know if it should be done. If that's what he's saying, then maybe I agree with that. But it is done, and that's what it is. And uh, actors like Pat's on the back. And I'm sure he loved getting a, an award just as much as other people do. I don't, I'd have to talk more about that. I don't know if I completely agree with him on that, because actors do compare. Uh, on an individual basis because they're tremendously competitive, as competitive as Wall Street or any place actors, artists are. They constantly knock each other. Can I, can I assume, Bob, that you weren't ready with the speech when you won your Obie for your off-Broadway performance? I wasn't there. Ulu had to do oh, you weren't me. even there? But when I, when I won, I, I won an award once for uh, the best uh, something or other in, uh, you know, for the New York film critics for, for The Godfather. And when Olivier won something, Alan Bates got up to say he received it, and then Gilgood made it an acceptance speech. And I turned to Ulu and I, I said, these English make us seem like mutes. They're so articulate. Of course, the accent helps. And I said the same thing to R uh, Richard Attenborough when I saw him in the Philippines. Said, these guys speak. They get up and speak. He outspoke President Marcos, <laughs> who's a tremendous impromptu speaker. And Imelda. Yeah, I, I'm all right with you know, back and forth like this, but I'll have to get up to give a speech. It's another thing. Yeah, they call her the Iron Butterfly. Yeah. And she doesn't even work in Hollywood. I know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that explains how you worked on your Dr. Watson accent for the 7% oh. solution. You wanted to do an English accent. Yeah, I wanted to do an English part. Let us take another break and we'll come back. Okay. Be right back with Robert Duvall. <laughs> Robert Duvall is with us. We've been talking around film and projects and theater, and I haven't said very much about... I, I've never met Bruce Beresford, but I certainly know Breaker Moran. Yeah, that's a wonderful movie. And I know that you are in Tender Mercies with, among others, Alan Barkin. Yeah, Wilford Brimley. Wilford, your friend, I Wilford Brimley. I insisted on Wilford. Did you? Gene Harper. Uh, Betty Buckley. 
Oh, from, from cats. 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 And a little boy named Alan Hubbard from uh, Paris, Texas. I'm dying to get him and Angelo Evans together to shake hands for a little publicity. It'd be great. He's wonderful. I put him on the phone, actually, with that East Texas accent and that New York Gypsy accent. It was funny. You're high on Tender Mercies, aren't you? I think so. I, I think it's a, a lovely movie. I think it would have maybe been edited differently and been a better movie, even. But it's, it's a lovely movie and uh, uh, some of my favorite work. Because I, I, I love working in Horton Foote's uh, Foot projects. And how about you and Bruce Beresford? Did you did you look at his work? Did you know his work before? Yeah, well, you Breaker went on? Morant was the main one I'd seen. I thought it was it was wonderful. I mean, there were certain differences, but you know, sometimes differences tend to add up. Than if it's all roses or whatever, you know. He brought a a, 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 a cinematographer from uh, and an editor and uh, from Australia. Yeah, and we all ended up in Texas. It it, it was a. Different kind of, it was different camps it seemed, and, and, and there wasn't a lot of communication, but somehow we did communicate. And uh, he he told the story. Uh, there were times when we didn't get along, you know, it happens. But so <clears throat> he came one day and was laughing, we're talking. He said, you know, the same crew was working on a big sequel to a movie, and he said they heard some screaming and yelling in the hotel, so they like forced the door open. There was a lead actor had the director on the floor choking him, banging his head on. So I think Bruce was like, we laughed about letting me know that our, our problems weren't that great because <laughs> there were just a few words exchanged once in a while, but <laughs> nothing like that. Now let me ask you something, Bob. Yeah. Did you tell Bruce Beresford while you were doing Tender Mercies that you confronted the legendary Henry Hathaway on the set of True Grit and you said, I'm going to take you up in front of the union. Yeah. And John Wade on the sidelines says, I think he's got the boy's gander up. <laughs> right, that's a true story. What did Henry Hathaway do to you on True Grit? Well, I kind of beat him to the punch. Now, he said uh, to Glenn Campbell, never acted for him, when I say action, tense up, blankety blank. You know, you don't, you know, you, you, can you imagine you say, now, Bob, right before the camera's roll for my show, tense up. I mean, that's the worst, that's the worst thing you could say to a performer of any kind. And, and I heard that, I said, and I'd heard about this, they re reduced full-grown men to tears, and that Jack Webb had made him get on his hands and knees and beg him to stay, he was gonna walk off a movie in front of the whole cast. So this guy had like a reputation, and I was nervous, so I kind of beat him to the punch. He said, son, I told you to put your horse here. I said, hey, don't give me that Martha Graham stuff. Don't pose me. I said, I, I had that at the neighborhood playoffs. We got into this violent argument. I got lightheaded, and we went on. John Wayne was getting a kick out of it. But you know, it was okay because uh, we ended up okay, and uh, but it's more old school, you know. You can't look around, look down, you know. Did you and John Wayne get along, Bob? Oh yeah, yeah. But when I told that story to Bruce, I think I think I did tell that story. He laughed, but yeah, I got along with it with the Duke, as they call him. He was, he was I a offer, nice man. I offer that back to you because I still remember the first time you met Donald Sutherland. And I, you didn't know you would work together again after you met yeah. Donald Sutherland because whether I talk about Robert Altman <laughs> and MASH and you were the one who got Hot Lips Houlihan right, right, yeah. in the tent. All right, now let's see if you come up with what, what when I told you Donald Sutherland. You, okay. No, go ahead. You, you walked up, you shook hands, and you said, hello, teach me how to be a communist. Right. <laughs> I said, if I come over your house tomorrow, you teach me how to be a communist. You don't know what to say. <laughs> it's true. It's an absolutely true story. How long a pause was it, Bob? <laughs> it was a... Pregnant pause, yeah, it's funny. Does Jane Fonda know that you called her a mink coat liberal? Well, I'm sure she is, but I, I you know, I don't know. I don't, you know, I, I don't say it with great viciousness, but it's probably true that our our, our business is inundated with with such people, and uh, I'm sure I would be considered like a. My wife's a little bit more liberal than I. I said, look, if I, if, at least if I'm a right wing bigot, so and so is a left wing bigot, you know. But I'm more down the middle, you know. I don't, I don't get politically into things. I, but. Uh, Oh, I know so you I'm don't. a little bit more like Wilfred. Now, Wil when Wilfred got off coming back from Yugoslavia doing High Road to China, he got off the plane, got down on his hands and knees, and kissed the ground <laughs> physically. I laughed so hard when I heard that. Yeah. But what did you do when you took your eye patch off when you'd finished The Eagle Has Landed? My eye patch? What do you mean? When, when you did The Eagle yeah. Has Landed, and you were playing a very complicated Nazi. Oh, yeah. You had an eye patch. Right. And I, I would just imagine when, when the last shot was called and you knew you were taking the eye patch off for the last time. I just, I'm curious, I guess, what's it like working with one eye covered? Oh, and oh, playing a Nazi. Well, you know, I, speaking of that, you know, uh, uh, I got on a, uh, on a helicopter, I had to leave Bel Air in the Philippines because they were behind. 
to fly to London to do that part. And I didn't have much time to prepare. I mean, as I flew away, I mooned the set from the helicopter. And we got to England, and I had a, just a little time to work on the accent and everything. They threw the eye patch on me. I didn't have, and he said, action, the first scene. And I had to be a smoker. I went to light that cigarette, and I missed by this much. Because when you cover up one eye, you, your deaf perception, some, somehow it falters. And I kept, I, I couldn't get that cigarette at first. I was kept missing. So it's a strange adjustment to make, not having had a lot of time to work with that eye patch and smoke at the same time. So I learned on film, kind of, as it, as it were. When you did Bullet with Peter Yates, did you and Steve McQueen become friends? Were you buddies? No, because I didn't really work that much with him. I, I, had, I worked three days with pay and then had five and a half weeks off with pay. So that's when I really learned how to play tennis in the Chinese playground up in San Francisco. And then I came back on the set and, and the director, sometimes, I don't know, sometimes you get, and that was another time, I, I didn't mean to, but like the director said, well, you did and I went, ah! Like, what nuts? And everybody looked at me, because I had been away from the set for so long that I, it's like I didn't know what was expected of me, and suddenly I got, like, conflicting bits of direction, and, like, then I, I had a quick outburst, and it was over, because, like, and Steve McQueen looked at me like I was, you know, but uh, those thing, things happen sometimes when suddenly you, you, you don't work for so long and then you throw them back on the set, people start hemming, in, hemming you in a little bit. But I never really had much to do with him because I didn't, you know, we didn't work together and I didn't really get to know him at all. Bob, what happens when you're the kind of actor who prepares the way you prepare? I said earlier, you arrive when your character has passed. You have the nuance you have. It, yeah. When you're working on a film like The Detective and you have a star whose name is over the title, like Frank Sinatra, yeah. who prefers to do everything in one take and would like to leave. Yeah. He threatens to throw, throw that scene out if it's not done at a minimum of pace. Do you just say, well, it says Frank Sinatra in The Detective, and if we don't get it the first time, we don't get yeah, it? Yeah, it's been so long. You know, uh, that's fine if he wants to wait. Sometimes it is better to get things on the first few takes. I used to be more like that. I, I'm a little more patient to try more takes now. but. It's okay. The only thing I really remember about that movie specifically was that Paul Newman came to visit Frank Sinatra on the set. And he came out, Sinatra came out, and here comes Paul Newman walking up the street with an entourage of a bevy of beauties. <laughs> you know, and following, and here comes Sinatra, came Sinatra, and, and I said, these two, I said, now there's power. That's power. You know, these two guys that were such big public figures had f instant followings wherever they go. Not that I necessarily would want, want that, but it was a certain phenom that was I evidenced then in, in May. I remembered it very much. When you and Robert De Niro have the history you have together, and you do a film like True Confessions, is there a freedom, is there um, a resiliency where Ulu Grossbard will let the two of you sit down and work out a scene? John Gregory Dunn and Joan Didion right. were on the set a lot. Yes. They both said, we're the only two writers in Hollywood who hate being on the set. But they were there because if anybody wanted anything rewritten, adjusted, yeah. adjusted, whatever, it could be done. Right. Was and there was a, a slight pause. Uh, John Gregory Dunn would say, he would like nod and say, okay, it's all right to improvise a little. Most, most writers don't like that, you know, but we change here and there a little bit. But they were, they were always around, yeah, and, you know, and I, I'm, su I'm sure a good, in a good way. Yeah, but it was it was nice working on that film because De Niro's a kind of a guy. He's always a little inaccessible, it seems. You know, I think in life we once said to him, "Let's go to watch football games." No, I don't watch football. He's the only guy I know that doesn't watch a Super Bowl. I can't believe that, you know. But that's the way he is. And that part it was good for that part because he that the priest he played was a little, you know, and he's like that in life too, a little, always a little bit like that, you know, more than most I think. Do you know the story? That, but it's a Jerry Lewis story. That yeah. during, during the shooting of King of Comedy, Robert De Niro wanted Jerry Lewis's watch. And <coughs> Jerry Lewis had gone to Winston-Salem to play golf. They had to get a guard to open a hotel suite to take the watch. He put it on, put his shirt over it, put his jacket on, and did the scene, and nobody could see the watch. De Niro? Yeah, and Jerry Lewis maybe. said, if it made him feel better, some people might think it's cuckoo, but that's where genius comes from. The yeah. watch did something for right. him. It's like I heard when De Niro was working with, uh, with uh, you know, Mitchum that he disappeared and they kept waiting and he came back and Mitchum said, where were you? He said, well, I, was, I had to find my character that I was looking at. Him. Okay, so <laughs> the next day Mitchum disappeared it's for 20 minutes and he said, well, I was looking for my character too. I finally found him. <laughs> kept everybody waiting. <laughs> 
we have to take another break. Right. Robert Duvall is with us. We've been talking about film, actors, stage. I was mentioning specific titles to you and asking or saying things about... I suppose it really goes back to the times when, when studios like MGM or Columbia or Paramount really were machines and everything yeah. got done. And now when you put your money and your belief into something like Angelo, my love, and you want it to work and you want it to succeed, there's a whole new kind of distribution exhibition pattern now where things are happening. And I mentioned to you that in a conversation with John Voigt once, I had brought up the revolutionary. And John, because the two of you worked in it together, and John Voigt said with surprise, oh, you saw that? Yeah. And it always surprises me when an actor registers surprise that you've seen something that is yeah. ostensibly a failure. Yes. You know, you, have to, you feel justifiably that people have never seen tomorrow. Right. And of course they haven't because it wasn't distributed the way it might right. have been. I don't care if they saw D.B. Cooper, but I do care that maybe they didn't see Tomorrow. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Maybe. You know another performance of yours that's just a knockout? The work you did for Sidney Lumet in Network. Oh. And that cast and that group of people, yeah, that was nice. there couldn't be a more frightening television executive right. for real in New yeah. York than the one you gave yeah, us. I, I enjoy doing that, yeah. Did, yeah. Did I just come back from England doing the other really? thing, uh, which I enjoyed more, doing uh, the Watson role. Seven percent solution. Yeah, but the, you know, once again, uh, it's strange. You know, I went to a screening of the seven percent solution. Nobody had forewarned me or told me. I went in, and some of the most, some of the best work I did in the film was cut, and I was never told till I saw a screening with other, where he was seventy years old and telling the whole story in, in, in flashback form. So all that older stuff was cut out. I'd seen it in screening in New York, and then by the time I went to California, it was out. So you never have, even when conditions you think are good and you can trust people, they, they still cut things out for whatever reasons. But tell me something. When your history with a man like Coppola goes all the way back to the Rain People, right. and you and your friend Jimmy Conn are doing that extraordinary work with Shirley Knight and yeah. those actors, and then you are doing Apocalypse Now, and everybody says Lieutenant Colonel Kilgore was what that movie was all about, and you say, well, what was there was okay, but I had a scene where I put a wounded Vietnamese boy on my helicopter to send him for help yeah. that was so important, yeah, such an integral part of the story. Do you sit down with Coppola and say, Francis, why? Where is the scene? I eventually did, uh, but he was nuts like, you know, the, the opening of the film, so why? He might have gone into a tirade. It wasn't my film, it was his. We'd done it three years prior or whatever, so my memory had faded. And, and, and I, I've since brought it up and said, well, maybe we'll put it back in when we do it for the TV version. I don't know why he cut that. As I've said before, I think I get the feeling, I may be wrong, I may be paranoid, but I got a feeling he was under the influence of one of his, of it, of his uh, chic liberal friends in San Francisco to take that out that it made, showed too good of a side to me. Now, maybe I'm wrong. It showed a contradiction in this guy that the guys can go out and kill the parents of a Viet Cong village and take the, a Viet Cong baby and literally put him in a helicopter to, to go back and, and be rehabilitated uh, medically while we surf. And those things did go on. So, see, people, there are contradictions in people, you know. There are, those things are there, the black and the whites, you know. And he cut to some reconnaissance plane or something. I, you know, I, I don't know why he did it, you know. What am I, I, I didn't want to bring it up at the opening because he had so much on his mind. It's his film, it's not mine, you know. It was a it, it, it was only something that was cut out, important not to the film, maybe, as you had said, but really, really more important to my, my character, I feel, you know. And since we made a point of filming it, I don't know why it was cut out. I still don't know why. Bob, you... Unless it brought em too much emphasis to that big uh, cameo or that big s that sequence there, because they had to move on to get to the end of the film. Were you working on Apocalypse Now when Harvey Keitel was still yes. doing Willard? Yes, I was. Because when they reshot everything, I got over my fear of heights and I got a little better the next time because I was hanging out the helicopter like this instead of, you know, like eventually like this. And I was there the day I was in, sitting in my wonderful bamboo hooch dressing room that the Philippines so wonderfully made for us. Coppola walked by. Nobody else was around. Somehow it's just because sometimes you'd only get one or two shots a day. And he, and he didn't have to talk to me, because I, but I just happened to be there. And he said, I have to make a decision here new actor, this, and so then he went back to the States and there was a replacement 
process that went on and so forth. And they reshot when they got the new guy. But I was there when, when Harvey was there, yeah. When you put your own money into a project like Angelo, My Love, and you are also the director, and you have to sit down in front of machines and edit and take out and put in, do you have a better understanding of what happened with Herbert Ross and 7% Solution, Apocalypse Now? Do you say, yeah, oh, now I'm I a director? Do. I do. I have a better, true, I do have a better understanding. But uh, in the, I, maybe, uh, maybe Ross a little bit. You know, the, I, I thought it was a better movie with it, but they thought the audience would get confused in the pocket, which was just a little thing. I know what you're saying. Uh, I had a wonderful editor, Stephen Mack. He edited the, the Jet Set as well. And uh, our first cut on the Gypsy movie was four hours and 25 minutes. And I mean, it got to be where we had the character. We had, I actually went to Coppola and asked him to see it to give a little advice. And uh, we had to weed it down, weed it down. And, you know, it's, they say it's painful to throw things out. But it got to be, finally, that when ho we say that whole segment can go, and it would be wonderful segments, there wouldn't be no pain. It would, be, it would be such relief to find, to get it from 206 to 155. It's, oh, my God, at least now that it can go, you know, it got to be a relief to finally get rid of things. But at first, there were pearls, you say, gems that had to be thrown out. But I, I, I do have somewhat of, more of an understanding that, you know, you have to make a streamline a movie somewhat. You know, it just can't go on and on and on. I thought there were things in Tender Mercies that uh, shouldn't have been cut. I thought there were things in the True Confessions that should have, been, should have been cut. That it could have been a little longer movie. It wasn't that long. But maybe if I were the director, maybe I would think differently. If I were in their shoes, the way, the way I, I think differently or thought differently when we edited uh, Angelo, My Love. It is a different... A, you're, you're in a different position. You're filling different shoes. How far back do you and James Kahn go? Well, I met Jimmy Kahn at a, at, a, at a dinner party at Wayne Rogers' house years ago when he was with his first wife and uh, used to play touch football and so forth and so on. And then we did a film together. He said, come on, we'll do it with me, uh, with Robert Altman, Countdown about, about the astronauts. And then I guess when they were doing The Rain People, Another actor was playing the part, Rip Torn, and I, something happened. I don't know what happened. So they said, now we want somebody to take this guy's place. So Jimmy recommended me, and I came in, and I didn't know how to get along with Copeland. He was kind of a moody guy. Kind of reminded me of a guy with an all-day sucker in his mouth. He always got whatever he wanted. Kid got everything. Movie studio, a car, uh, a Napa Valley uh, vineyard, you know, estate. And uh, he kept saying, uh, your friend, Bob, he's not doing anything. And Jimmy said, don't worry, he's doing plenty, you know, you know, don't worry. So then we kind of built up confidence and, uh, you know, so forth. But we had great fun on there. And Jimmy and I became friends, and I would stay at his house sometimes. But, but, but lately I haven't uh, seen him, you know. It's, uh, I drove up to his house once when he was doing a film back east, and I could see mud in his... He had been a victim of that awful mudslide about uh, three, three and a half years ago, four years ago. When you look at a project like Killer Elite now, yeah. Are you pleased? Are you pleased with... I never saw the movie. You never saw Killer Elite? No. The, the one or two movies I've never seen just, it just didn't happen to get around. I, I heard it was okay. I just, I, I, I never really saw the complete thing there that uh, I'm sure it wouldn't be one of my favorite movies, but I enjoyed working on it very much. A lot of fun with Jimmy and his brother and these uh, different people. But uh, sometimes you just don't get around to seeing a film. I probably will sometimes. There have only been about two or three that I haven't seen. I usually get to see them all once at least. Bob, do you agree with Maureen Stapleton that actors have to be clever as rats to survive? Rats? You mean emotionally or financially? How did she mean? I mean, just overall or? I think the struggle, I think the, the more actors I meet, the more people I speak to, whether it's you, John Voight, Dustin Hoffman, whomever, and the reality that actors spend most of their lives waiting for work. Yeah, well, in that sense, you know, I think that uh, maybe we are like rats. I don't know if that's a good parallel, but yeah, there, maybe there is that thing you're always waiting. You always, uh, I think sometimes the rat doesn't stay hungry, though, when he keeps working. And you got to stay hungry no matter how old you get. Kim Stanley once said to me, there are brilliant actors in this country uh, in America from age 25 to 40, but after 40, something happens. You get hungry, you get lethargic, and... I always try to remember that, you know. And some actors get better as they get older. Some better, a young, young guy like Gene is mature. I think, I hope, hopefully I think I've matured. I always try to think of myself in the 
the potential state always trying to improve. As long as you, you know, you, whatever you are, rat, whatever, I don't I care what, as long as you stay hungry and stay willing, open to being better and improving, I think. But it is a, it is a different kind of profession. It is. When you turned 50, were you a happy 50? Did you say, I'm 50 and things are on course? Yeah, I think so. You know, somewhat, uh, uh, I said, oh, oh I, if I could only straighten out my social life, the rest of it's okay. I thought Gail had done that for you. Well, I wasn't quite married then. Oh. We got married six months ago. We had a 14-month hiatus. We both went our separate ways, and after we finished filming the Gypsy movie when we were editing, but, but then we did get married. But, but when I turned 50, yeah, I felt that uh, somebody says, are you uh, the prime of your life? Uh, uh, or, or what do they say? Are you, have you reached the pinnacle, they asked me the other day. I said, I don't know if there is a pinnacle, but I'm in my prime. There's no pinnacle, maybe, but there's a prime. And I think that uh, I feel very good about things, you know, because I, I'm, you know, when I was 30, my brother said, happy birthday, what's it feel like to be a 30-year-old teenage adolescent? <laughs> you know, I think I, 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 you know, you hang out with younger people sometimes. I, I welcome the fact, I welcome the opportunity to work with younger people, younger directors, if they know what they're doing, you know, and, uh, and, and don't bluff it. Uh, so I, I always try to hang out with all kinds of people, young, old, but a lot of young, too, because you can always learn. And so I, uh, I don't want to, I want to grow old, uh, what's the, I don't even know the word, I want to grow old, you know, I don't know the word, not graciously, but you know. Gracefully? Gracefully, but uh, open. I want to grow old open. And hungry. Yeah, and, and, a, and a bit hungry, yeah, from the, from the point of view of trying to do better and better work, you know. And, and at the moment, I am hungry because I, I still owe myself money from the Gypsy Project. I'm trying to replenish the larder. But maybe that's okay. Maybe if I were a little bit too comfortable, I, would, I wouldn't be as much on guard as I am what's next, you know. So uh, I feel good about where I am now, I think, in, in my life. Yeah. I think that's interesting, considering that one of the first pieces of work you ever did that got you acclaim and led to movies was an important play called Call Me By My Rightful Name. <laughs> you didn't see that, did you? No. I don't know if it was a good play or not. I, I remember being in it. Well, the theater books seemed to think it was a good play, and I you guess. were good in it. I, I remember I was on, uh, sleeping one time in rehearsal, and the guy's talking to me. I have a black roommate. We have a big thing because I'm a big liberal and so forth. But then he goes out with my fiance and kind of takes her away, my girl. And then my, my racial thing is really tested. And I'm, li I'm lying in bed there. I'm thinking, I'm thinking in, 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 the, in the play. And during rehearsal, I said I almost wanted to do and didn't and maybe should have but didn't have the nerve. I wanted to get up out of the bed during rehearsal, walk out of the theater, and just leave that project forever. I, did, I didn't really like it. I wasn't that enamored with that whole project. It was okay, but uh, uh, I didn't do that, obviously. Did it for eight or ten months, but... Uh, what about the days and nights of B.B. Well, Fenster? You read my mind, I guess. I, that was a very pleasant experience. Although we had done a one-act version of that, was a, which was an even better play, I thought. But they, they, they did away with that, and we, Bill Snyder, who was so, so very gifted, I think, uh, wrote a three-act play, or it was a two- or three-act play. It was st still was wonderful, and that was, that was a good experience. I enjoyed working that very much. Stanley Beck was in it, and, uh, and, and Wedgeworth was in it. Uh, I think Rip Torn's first wife, wonderful actress from Dallas, Texas. And Lulu directed that. Rose Gregorio was in it. She's now on Broadway, you know, playing. Considering the fact that one of the early things you did in workshop was Camino Real. Yeah, right. At, did at, you, the, at the neighborhood playhouse. Yeah, Sandy Meisner. Right. Did you ever meet the late Tennessee Williams? I may have met, I think I met him once or twice. I think maybe I met him once. He seemed like out of it, you know, and, and, and I never, I once read, I once read for a replacement in Sweet Bird of Youth for Kazan and Tennessee Williams. And I thought I gave a good reading and nothing ever happened. And Geraldine Page came to call me backstage, and, and I'd done something. She said, I didn't think you were an actor. I thought you were a boy. They brought her from the South, and you did this. Then she, she said, you did one or two things that I, I thought I knew you were an actor, but it was so real that you really did in this one reading what certain people weren't able to do in over uh, several months' run. And I said, well, I don't think Tennessee and Kazan like to see that. I don't give a damn what they, but I, and you know, that was a wonderful compliment coming from another actor. 
but, but they saw me do that reading, and I didn't get the part, so that's, I had come in front of him at one time, at one, at one point in my young, early career, and maybe met him to speak to once, but I, he seemed out of it, so I don't know if he knew who I was or whatever. I had some recognition at the time, but maybe he did, I don't know. But, Am I uh, wrong, Bob, in thinking that you have a special rapport with Lee Remick? I don't mean just Ike, but going back to Broadway and Wait Until Dark? Not particularly. No? We worked twice together, and I think it worked out well. But I don't really know her personally at all. She has her own life, and I have mine. I think she married an Englishman. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, we never really sat down and really talked. Just never had that occasion. But uh, worked okay. we worked okay together, I think. I think it was fine, yeah. We, we the, the play, and then, uh, which I was only in a month. I busted my pelvis on a horse and had to get out. It was like... Uh, I had had enough of the play anyway, but that wasn't a very good way to get out, actually. And then the Eisenhower thing, which overall wasn't that happy of an experience. It was just too much work in that sh too short a time. But it kind of, there was a, a certain aspect of, its, of the whole project being salvaged, kind of, in my mind. But we got another di second director in, and we got to England. It was wonderful working with Freddie Young, great cinematographer. And I love working in London. And, uh, it ended up okay, but it was it was just too much work in a short period of time doing a miniseries. Forget about it. They offered me a, ch a chance to do uh, the current Pope in a miniseries. No way. It's just you know, there's so much talk that they have to give the character to, to explain to the audience. You know, not that the audience they feel is dumb, but it's almost as if they are. They feel that they have to explain everything to them. So you talk, 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 talk. When I was doing that Eisenhower project at one time, I was literally. They would do one take and then go again, learning my lines on film, you know, right on film. But uh, it, it, it was fine to work with Lee Remick, but, but I never really got to know her because, you know, she had her life, I had mine, and so forth, and I never really sat down and talked with her. Having studied with one of the great teachers, Sanford Meisner, is there any desire in you to teach, to sit no. in front of young actors and... Absolutely none. None? None. None. Well, you can do it by directing, then. Well, I want to direct because, you know, I, I, yeah, because that film, not stage, but film, interests me, you know, every few years because so few films, not so few, there are some, I don't mean to say few, uh, there are many old Hollywood films that, that are, have wonderful performance in, in many current Hollywood films and many current films from other countries and past films from other countries where well, you don't see very good acting. They don't really go after the real thing or try to, you know. And that's what I think film, you, that's what's so wonderful about films, that you can. I remember I saw a film called Kess by Kenneth Loach. And I came out puzzled as to how he got the performances out of these people using only one or two actors and a lot of real people. To me, it was maybe more real than even The Bicycle Thief. And certainly more real than, the, than what Truffaut did in film. This was this guy, Kenneth Loach. And I thought that Robert Young did it in a film called Alambrista. I don't know if you've seen it in America. A beautiful film on wetbacks coming across. But anyway, and Barbara Loden, Kazan's wife, did it in a film called Wanda. Every once in a while you see a certain spark reality that really approximates the real thing in the best sense of the word, word recreates it. And uh, really, Kenneth Loach was kind of my model or my hero for my gypsy film. And I think we accomplished a lot of that purity, getting of that purity of behavior in the gypsy film. Does Angelo have a falcon? I don't know what he had. He's got a line, though. <laughs> we, we one time took him to Majik's, and he loves to gravitate to the stars, so he went right up to Diane uh, Carroll. So in, in, in Ilya Nastasi, when he met him, he says, Hello, gypsy boy, I hear you're a genius. And Angelo says, Yeah, I am, and walked away. So everything Angelo would do, An uh, Nastasi, ho, ho, the gypsy boy, you know, he'd like get this biggest kick out of it. So he got out on the floor dancing with. He danced in the movie, but since then he's become like a, uh, he's an amazing disco dancer, this little gypsy kid. How old is he now? He's 13, but he's still small. So he got out on uh, Majik's dance floor, dancing like four of them in kind of a nondescript circle. It was uh, uh, Angelo, uh, Diane Carroll, uh, Nadia Komenich, and Ilya Nastasi. They all look like sticks compared to Angelo. <laughs> he was so great dancing. He's something, yeah. The one thing we can be sure of about you as a director is that you'll never tell an actor to tense up. No, I, I hardly ever use the word action when we did the gypsy film. I say, okay, 
go ahead, you know, rather, because very often that word action, there's a certain tension that sets in, except when there were certain obvious scenes when they were running, they said, action, because they want to hear that, because, you know, people love the word action, cut, roll, you know, like play like Hollywood, but try to keep people loose, yeah, because, you know, I've been through my moments, uh, you know, probably still do, you know, with certain directors and certain situations where you, that heady kind of self-consciousness, nervousness takes over and you just can't beat it. You discussed this with Olivier? Not too much. Did he know on the Betsy when you were working with Dan Petrie that you used to comb your hair just like him? No, I never did. But you he, never told him? No, but he, 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 would, he was wonderful because when he was in the Betsy, you know, which wasn't a very great film, uh, but he was, he was playing that guy Henry, like Henry Ford, supposedly. And he had a pretty good American accent. He was, but he, he, he's faltering and, uh, you know, his memory falters as he gets older. And he'd be, he'd be doing a scene and you'd say, uh, you know, ready to go action and they say uh, here we are at Hardeman Manor with the Hardeman family here in Lake Michigan oh sorry love what's my line oh thank you very much oh yeah <laughs> Hardeman Manor <laughs> like you go it's funny you could have done your Dr. Watson yeah. for him Bob. great storyteller I'm sure yeah those English they're great storytellers oh boy yeah I, I, sometime I'll tell you a story he told it about Olivia that was so f about, about Gilgit that was so funny but they don't have time right now I've enjoyed being with you. I have too. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>